Well, hello, beautiful people. How you doing? Uh, I need better than that. I'm sorry. You, I, I feel like I set the energy tone and you did not match it. So, how you doing? There it is. Actually, we're going to have a good time today. Uh, if you are here for the first time, welcome, welcome from all of us. To, from me to you, welcome to the party. It is a great joy of ours that you would spend this time with us, particularly if you would say that you are not a Christian. Man, and I, I'm being serious here, and I don't want to get too emotional. It is a honor, a deep, deep honor of ours that you would entrust just a few minutes on your spiritual journey to us. Like, we, we genuinely, genuinely mean that. And our hope here, we set up this space, all the other spaces, so that you can experience the love of Jesus and his people before you ever believe in Jesus. That's the hope here, is that you can be here and be loved by God's people, be loved by Jesus, before you ever actually agree with what we say. So, thank you so much for being here. We're so glad. If you got your mobile devices, go ahead and scan our QR code. We're going to be doing some things today. If you're online and watching a mobile device, renovationchurch.com slash sermon notes. That top one's for you. And if I move this code too quickly and you didn't get it, renovationchurch.com slash sermon notes. That's where they are. Uh, you picked a great day to be here. Because today and next Sunday is all about small groups. Yes. So let me give you some context real quick. Last week was Vision Sunday, and we said that our vision for the year, the word over our house, is freedom, which I'm a big fan of. Got a tattoo for that. Not even a joke. And we, love, we want the people of God in this house to be free. Now, here's the thing, though. We believe that freedom is found in the context of community, which means to be free, you need Jesus' people to experience the freedom in your life, emotionally, financially, spiritually, mentally, all those things. You need Jesus' people. And so today and next Sunday is all about telling you why and giving you the opportunity to find that community so that you can experience said freedom. Today, I get the great joy and opportunity to hopefully unpack for you what you're going to experience when you do, and I'm saying that somewhat in faith, when you do decide to join a small group and get into a community, what should that space be like, okay? And so to do that, we're going to be handling a few verses in the book of Colossians, which is my favorite, favorite letter in the New Testament. And so we've got several, but we're only going to read one. It's chapter 3, verse 14, and it says this, and over all these virtues... Put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Can we say amen? amen? Let's pray together, family. Holy Spirit, you've met us. Thank you. God, gratitude. Thank you for meeting us, your people. I pray right now that as we dive into this text, Lord God, you open our hearts, anoint the words that are coming out of my mouth, that they be of you, that they speak to your people. And open their hearts to experiencing the love of Jesus' people. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, yes. amen. Thank you so much, Jay. So as I was uh, researching and reading for a project that I'm working on, uh, I came across an idea, a sociological idea, that really hit me as it describes our culture, I think, in a way that we experience every single day. Now, this is going to get a little scientific -y. Stay with me just for a second, I promise, for all of the Georgia Tech students. Like, finally, our day, right? Um, <laughs> but it's called the atomization of society, okay? Now, let me, it's like this. It's looking at society through the analogy of molecules and atoms. And so this is what it means, right? As molecules or atoms inside of a molecule begin to have deep bonds with each other inside of that molecule, they become solid and hard. We're going to use water as our example, right? When the bonds between the individual water molecules become tight and solid, they actually form something stable, right? We, we call it ice. You can make sculptures out of it. You can stand on it in the right places in the world, right? You can use it for something that is tangible. You see it. You can experience it. You can depend on it. But as those individual atoms inside this molecule gain energy, okay? So they, they gain energy. 
the bonds between the individual ones of them, of the molecule, begin to get softer and weaker. And in doing so, it actually changes the state of what that thing used to be. So in the case of water, right? Tight bonds, we've got ice. Looser bonds, we've got water. All the way to the point that the individual atoms of that molecule have so much energy that they actually turn into steam which is this sense of like, we know it's there, but you can't really grab it. There's nothing tangible about it. It's just kind of floating in the air with this energy and just rising up all around us, right? Now, we take that idea and we apply it to just societies or communities in general. The society, every community, every society was formed because of their deep bonds within that community. They had to, right? Because they needed each other. Like, that's the thing. In every single community that is formed, when it is formed, the people of that community develop deep bonds out of need. Because if you're not there, I'll fall apart and float away. But as the individuals of that community become more self-sufficient, more independent, more, less in need of the others around them, their bonds with each other grow weaker and weaker and weaker and it fundamentally changes the state of the community or the society that they exist in. You, you move from a tight-knit society to, I think, what we experience today. We're like, are we really sure any of us have any cultural alignment whatsoever? Like, if you look and experience it around today, you're like, I'm not even sure we agree on anything anymore. Our bonds are weak. We, we see it. The, the people are there, but it's not really tangible. It can't really be depended upon. It, it, it can't really be grasped. It's just an amorphous cloud of individuals. Now, I think the analogy is pretty clear. We, we exist in a state of what all of atomi atomizing the individuals around us. Our society is fragmenting and pulling apart. And there are a lot of, of different consequences to this, right? Because it's almost like we sacrificed our togetherness for individualism. We said, I want to be independent, and so we let togetherness die. And the impacts and consequences of this are many, but in my, I believe that the most dire is the lack of experiential love in our lives. Like, love requires presence. Love requires bonds. And so when we make the bonds between other people weak, when our alignment together is soft, the effect of love in our life decreases. As I heard one pastor say it this way, without presence and without sacrifice, you can't have love. Without presence and without sacrifice, you can't have love. And so what this means for us as Christians is that we lack love when we treat our church as an optional convenience. We lack the experiential power of love in our lives when you treat your church with optional convenience. Love and optional are not complementary. Love and convenience don't hold hands. Love, real love, is modeled by presence and sacrifice. And I don't know if you've looked around our world recently, but those two things are in short supply. And regardless of where you're at on your spiritual journey, here's what's true of all of us is that we need to experience love to have a healthy soul. If we lack love in our lives, our soul is in pain or perhaps even sick. Maybe that's why mental health issues are on the rise right now. And this is why I think the scripture that we're looking in today is so powerful. Because it 
it states and then frankly unpacks that God's people are known by how they love one another. That is one of our identifying characteristics straight from Jesus. That God's people are known by how we love one another. And so what I want to do for the next 15 minutes, and I mean quickly for the next 15 minutes, is just kind of look at what Paul's argument is here. Just point to a few different things about what this looks like to be a community that is centered around Jesus in love. What are you being invited into when you join community? And so we begin this with verse 12. And it says that, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy, dearly loved. Now, Paul begins his whole argument doing something that he does Throughout every letter he writes, and it's throughout the Bible. We can't have a conversation about your behavior until we talk about what you believe about yourself. That's right. Until we cement your identity in who you are, your behavior is secondary because belief determines behavior. What you think about yourself, what I think about myself, what we think about ourselves as community, what we think about God determines how we act in this world. And so Paul starts by saying, I need you to know who you are, or nothing else I'm going to say makes sense. And who you are is the chosen, blameless, and dearly loved people of God. That's who you are. That's what it means to be a Christian in this world. And look, I'm not saying like this is a perfection thing. Like nobody gets this right all the time. That's the gift of being part of the people of God. We do not judge each other by our worst moments. We judge each other, because we do judge each other, by our trajectory. You fall off the wagon one day, hey man, let's just get back up on it. Are we on the same journey together? That's what we're looking at. And there's a freedom and a gift in being a part of a community that says, hey, even though you fell off the wagon today, you are nonetheless still chosen, you are still blameless, and you are still dearly loved by God. That is who we are. And so now that we can agree upon our identity, Paul then moves on to what we should look like in this world. And he uses the analogy of clothes, like what you wear as a Christian, right? What do you wear as the chosen, holy, dearly loved people of God, right? And he names six things specifically, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, and forgiveness. There's six characteristics, six virtues that are the clothes we wear. This is like the the Team Jesus jersey that we have everywhere we go, right? When you see people who exhibit these six characteristics, like, oh, we on the same team, bro. That's dope. Team Jesus, yay. But there's like, a tr- there's like a flip side of this, though, where you don't see these six characteristics in growing fashion, right, trajectory, even if they say, I'm a Christian, if you don't see those, you should really question their statement. Because you can say a lot of things. But do you exhibit, are you wearing the jersey? Or are you just the dude in the stands going, I'm part of the Philadelphia Eagles. Like, no, you not. (laughs) You couldn't even run down this field without passing out. Sorry, I have a thing with sports fans telling professional athletes what to do. Um, Yeah, it's it's absurd. Um, Are you wearing the jersey? And when you don't see these things, when you don't see these things, it's okay to go, I'm not sure we're on the same team. You're on some team, somebody's team. You might not be on Jesus, right? But here's the thing. I'm aware that we can reinterpret things very easily and to fit our cultural paradigm. And so I'm not going to let you off the hook. I'm going to define these for you very quickly. Uh, We're going to start with compassion. A Jesus-like sensitivity to the needs and sorrows of others. You want to see that? There's a scripture for you. Kindness. A Jesus-like attitude towards others. Humility. A Jesus-like attitude towards yourself. Go read it. Read your Bible. I did it. Uh, A Jesus-like restraint in using power and authority. Gentleness is not weakness. Gentleness is restraint. That's right. That's right. 
restraint. Patience, a Jesus-like endurance with people's progress. And finally, forgiveness, a Jesus-like response to people's sin. These are the qualities of Team Jesus. So we have to ask ourselves the question, do people see these of us? I mean, like, I'm right here, right? I'm, I'm on the stage. It ain't, it ain't devoid of me. Do people recognize these six qualities in his people? When they walk through those doors, do they experience patience? When they walk through those doors, do they experience kindness? These are what the world should experience from God's people. But as I meditated on this list, I actually noticed something. These things can be faked for a time. I mean, it really can, right? So um, I can forgive you within reason until you hit that thing, right? Uh, I can be kind to you as long as you ain't being a joker, right? Pity and patience look eerily similar on the surface, So if we're supposed to do this, and we're actually supposed to be on the team, wear these things for real, how do we keep doing it? How do we know we're not faking it? The Apostle Paul gives us the answer to that in the next verse. It's love. He says, love binds all these virtues together in perfect unity. Love does not allow me to to just be patient with you and not question my own internal motivation as to why. Love removes the limits of my forgiveness because my Savior forgave me. Love removes the qualification of being deserving to my kindness. It is love that puts all of these things together in perfect harmony. Love is the bond that holds the people of God together. It brings it together. Like there's this beautiful thing that Paul is saying here. It's like you're wearing all these different things, this compassion, this kindness, this forgiveness, but none of it works until you have love. None of it goes together until love is radiating from you. It is love that binds it together. And so these are what it means, how we're supposed to interact, the the code of Team Jesus, as it were. And so Paul then moves from talking about how we interact with each other to like taking his gaze a little bit further out and looking at what happens to a community when these things become active and effective, okay? So once we nail this, like we get love down and all these virtues, what then happens next? And so he says in verse uh, verse 15, it says that the peace of Christ will rule over you. Now, I need to tell you that any time that the original hearers would have heard the peace of Christ, it would have like triggered them because they lived in the Roman Empire, which lived under a thing called the Peace of Rome or Pax Romana. And here's what that meant, is that Rome says we have brought peace to the world because we have conquered and oppressed and thrown out anything that is not Rome in our community. So you are. This was like their their pitch to the people. You're free to find flourishing and calling within the Roman Empire because if there's ever an uprising, we will violently and overwhelmingly oppress it. And so be free within reason. And so Paul then says, we're different. Let me contrast that Pax Romana with the peace of Christ, or as some scholars call it, call it Pax Christiana. We are ruled by a peace, but it's not out of fear of violence and oppression. It's out of love and sacrifice. The peace of Christ reigns here because the thing that holds us together is the love and sacrifice and presence of Jesus. Which means that you are free to figure things out without fear of retribution. Paul even says it this way. You're free to wrestle with your salvation with fear and trembling. 
You're free to maximize flourishing all the way around you because when inevitably conflict rises, the peace of Christ reigns and so we work it out. The peace of Christ reigns. So when we're at a tiff, when, when something comes up in the community, because let's be honest, it's going to happen. We're constantly battling sin. Sometimes sin wins. But when that happens, because the peace of Christ rules us, it doesn't sever relationships. We just work it out, knowing that the same Jesus that saved me saved that person. And that we live under the rule and reign of his peace. This means you are free to take off your mask here. When you get in a small group this next week, and I believe it's going to happen, you are free to be honest and take all the mask off, all the pretense off, to just be you. Because in that environment, the peace of Christ is what rules over us. This is the gift. And so there's some things that happen when you have the peace of Christ ruling over you, the freedom that comes with that. Paul says we now have the freedom to now challenge and teach one another in wisdom. Yes, we must be challenged. Like this love, like I, I love this. Like we think we hear love like this hippie 1970s love, like everything's love. I knocked over my mic. Everything's love. <laughs> That's not that. Like, like, Pastor Lance really summed it up well at First Wednesday, if you missed it, um, and it's really great. It's truth without love is violence. Love without truth is poison. And so we do both. We have truth with love here. We engage one another. We challenge. That's what admonish means. We challenge one another based upon the message and good news of Jesus. And so you're free to do that because when that comes up, it's okay. Because the thing that binds us together is love. The thing ruling over us is peace, not disunity. But there's an interesting thing that Paul ties this to. Right? He, he says that this challenging, this teaching is tied to singing. Nope, that's not it. Tied to singing. Let me go back one. There it is. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through what? Psalms? Hymns, songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Your challenge of me, your teaching of me is tied to singing with me. Can, can I dig for just one second? Is that okay? Are you all going to be all right with this? I hope so. I'm going to do it anyway. Look, if you have a problem with something or someone, and it's going to happen... Let's be very clear. You might be upset with me right now. I understand. It's going to happen. Before you go and admonish, challenge said person, I want you to ask yourself one question. Do I regularly, and the way that the Bible defines regularly, sing with that person? Do I? Like, if you do... Like, right on, Christian soldier. Have a great time. Like, go to it. But if you don't, go sing first. I know this sounds funny, but there is something that happens in corporate worship. It has a unifying effect for the people of God. When you are with me, singing the praises of Jesus with me, all of the sudden, we become bound together because we know we're serving and following the same Jesus. Before you teach or challenge, go sing. I don't care if you can't sing. It doesn't matter. That's not the point. Go sing with them. Because here's the thing. The thing you may be feeling may be real. But I guarantee you, if you regularly worship Jesus with those people, how you present it will change dramatically. And look, if, before you think that this is just like that pastor trope of like, you need to be in church. It ain't that, right? Let me go back to the top. Love and presence holds hands. They hold hands. And if you aren't present with the people, 
Are you sure you love them? Maybe you do, but your presence shows us. And so how much more am I open to receiving, being taught, being admonished, challenged from a person who does not have presence with me or a person who does? Love and presence hold hands. We must begin to worship together because it unifies us. So Paul then wraps up this piece, this little section, with ending in a way that is, it seems very simple on the surface, but is incredibly countercultural. Incredibly countercultural. He says, Be grateful. That's basically it. Oh, gotta go one more, sorry. And whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord, giving thanks. Whatever you do, be grateful. Do you know how life-changing, environment-changing gratitude is? Like, I see all the time communities form around discontent. Like, all you got to do is just go to the second post on any social media feed you get through. It's there. Communities form around discontent very quickly. But none of them change anything. Like, gratitude... Do do you know of a community that one of its central tenets is just being thankful? And when you've experienced said community, does it not make you want to be a part of it more? Beyond even that, does it not make you want to start adapting some of their ways into your own life? Like, Like, do this at your job. I'm sure there's tons of discontent at your job. Decide to be grateful. And watch how it changes. You know it will. Watch how it changes the environment that you're in. Like, grateful people make great spaces. Grateful people make great spaces. That's why Paul says, do this. Be thankful in everything. Because it creates an environment that is attractive and can change the world around it. And so, as as we wrap up, I think it's pretty clear to all of us why this matters for us. Right? Regardless of where you're at on your spiritual journey, we want a community like this, don't we? We need this. Like, I, I know we really value our individualism and our independence. I get that. But we want this. A place where just they forgive, they're kind, they're grateful. And so here's what I'll do. Uh, If you're not a Christian, not, not a follower of Jesus, this is your invite today. This is what God is inviting you into. To be a loved people that love people. Not just to experience the love of a Savior, but the love of his people. And so here's all I want to do. I just want to pray for you. Whether you're in the room or online right now, I just want to pray for you, and you just pray in your heart what that looks like, and I'm going to tell you what's next step after that. So let's pray real quick. Holy Spirit, we ask right now that for those who are here who say, I need Jesus. Because that's fundamentally what it means to be a Christian, is to go, I am insufficient to lord my own life. I need you. Father, I pray that as they make that posture in their heart and in their lives right now for the first time, that you fill them with the love that you have for them. That they experience wherever they are, the presence, the active presence of King Jesus. And as they begin the first step, first moment into their brand new life. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Look, if, if you're online and that's you today, here, here's what I want you to do. It's really easy. I want you to text the phrase, I became a Christian, all one phrase, to 94000. Um, myself or one of our other pastors will follow up with you very quickly. And we just want to help you take your next step into this beautiful family of God that is now yours. And if you're in this room, here's what I want you to do. At the end of this, there's going to be a first-time guest QR code. On that form is a little button that says, I became a Christian. Just click it. 
And we'll follow up with you very quickly because you now, every single Christian in this space is now family with you. They're family with you. Welcome to being a loved person among a loved people. Now, if you already walked in here a Christian in the people of God, yours is a little bit different. It's a little bit extra. Because you already walked in a loved person. So I want you to be a loved people that love people with a qualifier by being fully present people. Love and presence hold hands. By being a fully present people. I want to experience the full love of God in my life, and unless you're present with us, it doesn't happen. Be a loved people who love people by being fully present people. And here's how you do it. I want to give you three things very quickly. Get in a small group. Do it. And take the mask off, man. Stop being fake. Just the peace of Christ rules us, right? You can be honest. And if somebody gets upset, find me. Get in a small group. Be a part of the community. Grow your bonds with other people and experience more love in your life. Second, worship with weekly. Sing with us. Please. No, I'm totally serious. I enjoy singing with you. It does something to me when I look around the room and there are people who are passionately lifting up King Jesus with me. Sing with us. Worship weekly with your people. And then finally, serve with your church. Like, our hope here has never been to just be here. It has been to be a community of Jesus that this city can't live without. Like, if we just were wiped off the map, we want the city of Atlanta to go, that's a loss. And so serve with the people of God. Get in a group. Be real. Be authentic. Take the mask off. Sing and serve. And to tell you more about that, our wonderful pastor Sylvester is going to come up right now. We're going, to tag, we're going to do the thing? I, 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 felt, I felt like I didn't get it last service. Oh, oh absolutely. High yes. Five. High tag five. team. High five. Uh, yes, church. Uh, it's so good to see you. Again, my name is Pastor Sly, and I'm joined by Sarah. Um, but before I talk about small groups, um, I want to go back to point number two. So uh, in the first service, I shared that I have a passion to sing. Um, however, there is one pastor on our staff who will not let me sing. All right? And so... Uh, we're going to take a little bit of time to pray with our eyes open uh, for another bald-headed brother to be on stage singing, okay? All right? No, I'm just kidding, just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. No, but anyways, though, um, we uh, are really passionate about small groups. Small groups changed my life, right? So I went from literally being on the street doing whatever I wanted to do to having some brave person invite me to church get me involved in the community, and my wife is not here, but I even met my wife in community. So I'm super passionate, and from there, I went to serving the community, leading groups, and then eventually, I was hired as a small groups pastor, right? So that is just my short testimony. However, we have Sarah with us, um, and I definitely want to ask you a few questions about small groups because they are important to the life of Renovation Church. And as much as you want to reveal, can you tell us a little bit about your life before you joined a small group and started attending Renovation Church? Yeah, so before I joined um, a small group, I, I've been coming here since early 2020. Um, and I was like probably a lot of Christians. I was coming to church. Um, I was also trying not to sin. Um, <laughs> that All of that was a journey <laughs> before that. Um, and, <laughs> and so... I would come to Sunday service, I'd be filled up by the sermon, by worship, I'd say hello to a couple of people, and then I'd leave, and I'd feel kind of empty, I hadn't really connected with anyone, um, I wasn't bringing God to the rest of my week, and it, it just, that, that's kind of where I was at that time. And her story is very familiar, right? I mean, we all know people who come to church every single Sunday and do not meet a soul, right? So when you came to Renovation Church, what small group did you join and why? 
So um, I chose a group that Katie and Shannon led, a women's group studying Genesis. Yeah. <laughs> um, I thought, you know, for me, I needed to get vulnerable, and, and a safe space for me was around women, so we, we always have some women's small groups. Um, and also thought, where, where better to start than Genesis? <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Um, yeah, that small group was phenomenal. So Katie and Shannon are really great teachers. Um, and I attended the, the uh, Bible study a couple times. Hope was there with me, too. Um, and they really got deep, like all the, the, the namings, right, in, in Genesis, all those names, they really mean something. So I even learned something in small group. So, um, yeah, you had a good time. So what were the next steps after you joined the small group? Yeah, so when that small group ended, I just wanted to keep going. <laughs> like, we've been reading Genesis, and I just wanted more. Um, I was going to go pound down Katie's house and, and be like, let me in. I want to keep talking. Um, and so I kept reading. And at the same time, I had read The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And I was trying to work less and create more time in my life for God. Um, so I started reading. I started praying. Um, and then the next semester, there's a small group that really was focused on just encouraging each other to maintain that time with God. Um, and it was so, and so encouraging seeing what God was doing um, in other people's lives. And even for myself, like seeing him directly answer prayers that I hadn't expected because I'd never had that prayer life. Um, and, you know, I was really spending more time with God. I was falling in love with God. Um, and at the end of that small group semester last May, I actually got to take sort of that um, step to then reflect what was happening inside, outside, and I was baptized. And everyone, everyone from my small groups was there supporting me, bringing me flowers, um, and it was just an amazing time. Um, and since then, my life's just completely changed. Um, I have been serving more. Um, I've been growing relationships with people I met in small group. Um, I even co-led a small group last semester with my friend, which is exciting. Um, so it's just, it's just completely changed me, and it all started with just getting vulnerable and signing up for a small group with a bunch of strangers. And she does mean that she served, so look at her shirt, show the shirt. Renovation Kids, like she literally stepped in. But one of the amazing things that I also get a chance to do is I get to oversee baptisms, and when your mother came, um, she was so sweet, um, and I just hope that when she left, she felt like you had a family that spiritually would take care of you. So uh, last question. All right, for anyone who's hesitating or hesitant to get into a small group, what would you tell them? Yeah, I'd say just just do it, um, <laughs> one. <laughs> I mean, it's, I think about it, it's like 10 to 12 hours spread over 12 weeks yeah. of your life. And, it, you know, when I started, I was nervous that I wasn't Christian enough for small groups. Like, I didn't, I didn't know enough. I needed to be the perfect Christian before I could even get in community. Um, it's not true. It's the place where you work that out with community. Um, so I just say just do it and see what God is going to do in your life. Like, he wants to wrap you up in his community. Um, he wants to show you what he can do through the love of other people. And just do it. Just do it. 10 to 12 hours over 13 weeks will get you community. It will get you known. It will get you seen. You'll be able to take off the mask and find freedom. And next week, over in the room next to us in the event center, we're having our first small group showcase. Can we clap for that, please? All right. So just a little preview of that is that we'll have everything set up with tables. We'll have our leaders there. There'll be candy, balloons, music, and a song from me. Yes, you'll get that. Um, however, <laughs> you'll be able to sign up for small groups at, at the moment, right then and there through our Church Center app. So make sure you download our Church Center app, okay? All right, so can we make a promise that we'll get into community, that we'll push through and become more like Jesus? Amen. All right, guys. Well.